Hello, and in this new series, we're going to be taking a look at each of the phases of the game of Warhammer 40k. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the movement phase. So, Mike, where do we begin with the movement phase? Well, Jordan, I think it's important to point out that this series is focused on beginners. So we're going to help you guys understand each of the steps in each of the phases of the game, um, how far models move, when to move them, why to move them. Um, but for further details, we do, of course, have the start playing course. Yes. This is like your little guide to getting you on the tabletop playing the game. So movement phase. There's several different types of moves we can do. But first of all, we need to know how far a model can move. And where would we find that? So that's obviously on your data sheet. OK. Um, and all of the measurements in 40k are done in inches. The very first thing we're going to look at is, of course, normal moves. Mm -hmm. So this is where your units move their move characteristic on the tabletop. What is the move characteristic of an intercessor? It is six inches. Fantastic. So you can now make a six inch normal move using your tape measure. You've got to make sure that all the models in your unit are within two inches of another model. And we call that unit coherency. Um, it is a bit more restricted when you look at bigger units. And we'll look at the Tyranids later um, to follow those rules. Now, what you'll see Jordan's doing here is he's measuring from the front of the base to the front of the base after it's moved. So the six on the tape measure is just in front of the Marine's base. And then when the Marine has moved, the front of their base is at the very end of the tape measure. And then we know that they've moved just six inches and no more. Now, when we've done normal move, we are eligible to do anything else we could normally do in the game, such as shoot, charge, um, maybe perform some mission parameter. Mm. There are other kinds of moves though. So what other moves are available to us as a player? So we can remain stationary. Okay. And this is not something necessary that you have to say to your opponent, but if you don't move a unit, they are remaining stationary. So is there any benefits to remaining stationary or is it just a choice of whether or not you just don't want to move the models? So uh, there are some rules that interact with remaining stationary, such as the heavy keyword, which helps you hit better. Mm -hmm. um, you may also wish to remain stationary because there's nowhere to move. You don't need to move. Um, or it may cause your opponent to have some kind of reactive input in the game where they could shoot you because you've moved or they could move away. So remaining stationary is an option for everybody. Now we have a second option here, which is the advance move. And all we're going to do is we're going to take our intercessors again mm -hmm. and we're going to move six inches because that's their move value. We're going to roll a dice and we're going to add that onto the six. Okay. So here's a dice, Jordan. Perfect. Roll that for me. A six. There we go, mate. Okay, and you'll often find in games of 40k, players will roll dice with symbols on them. They're usually sixes. Mm -hmm. uh, so these guys now, six plus their movement characteristic of six. Twelve. Twelve. Ooh. So these guys are very speedy. Yep. They're going to move 12 inches. Perfect. So because we've already moved them six here, I'll just move them the extra six and we can see where we can get them. So the other thing that's important to mention is I could go the full six here, but it's going to bring me in engagement range of these termagants, right? That's right. Engagement range is one inch. One inch. Um, and uh, you can't invade the personal space of um, your enemy's models. Yeah. So you can't go within one inch of them. So even though I have the extra move of six inches, because there's an enemy within five inches effectively, I can only really go five with these guys, right? Yeah. Uh, also important to mention, you don't have to move your full distance you've rolled, mm -hmm. nor do you have to move up to your full movement characteristic. Yeah. You can move three inches mm -hmm. if you so desire, or two inches, or five inches. You don't yep. have to move six. And likewise, when you're rolling an advance roll, you don't have to go the full distance that you've rolled. Advancing might restrict you from doing other things later in the turn. Right. For the vast majority of units, you won't be able to shoot and you won't be able to charge. Okay, so there are some disadvantages here to actually advancing, but if you need that extra bit of move, let's say, to get on an objective, then it can come in handy in them instances, right? Exactly. Now we've got some other types of moves here. Um, the last one to discuss is actually a full back move. Right. So let's imagine that you're actually in combat. So we'll put a few in combat there. Um, you can make a full back move if you are in engagement range of the enemy. Okay, how do I do this? So this is essentially just a normal move, Right. but you have to leave the combat. So all I'm doing is looking at my move characteristic again, and I'm using that to come out of combat. Do I have to move the full six, or can I just use enough? No, nope. again, you can just move up to your six. The only requirement is that you finish out of engagement range, that one inch of an enemy unit. So I could do something like this. Even though that's not the full six inches, I've still got out of engagement range, so I've done a full back move. Yes, yeah. Now, if you are in engagement range at the start of your movement phase, you only have the two options. Okay. One is to fall back, and one is to remain stationary. Right. You can't make a normal move and you can't make an advanced move. So, Mike, being a Blood Angel, I have jump pack guys. How does the fly keyword interact with the movement phase? Okay, so the fly keyword is very special because what it allows you to do is essentially move through that engagement range. 
of your enemy. opponent's models, yep. provided you don't end in the engagement range. Right. So you essentially fly over enemy units. So you just treat them as they're not there, but you... Basically, right, sure. um, but you just have to make sure you're not ending within an inch. Okay, so you can use your movement to clear them, but you can't end with an engagement range still. That's right. So what's the movement characteristic on these jump pack assault intercessors? So we have a movement of 12 inches. Fantastic. Mm. So very fast as well as flying. Exactly. So you can move. So I can move like this from the front to the front of the base as so. And because I am clearing these guys, I can end my base out of engagement range of both these units here. And I have successfully jumped over the top of those termagants. Okay, fantastic. Now, one interesting thing about your Assault Intercessor squad mm. is they actually have a character attached to them. They do, yeah. Um, now, leaders are um, your sort of heroes in the game and they can lead other squads. Mm. You also get characters that run around on their own. In this case, we have a captain. Yeah. Um, his movement characteristic is the same as the squad. Yeah and he's just treated as part of that unit for all purposes. So just like his squad, he's jumped over the unit mm -hmm. and he's just landed within that two inches of uh, the rest of his friends. Yes. Okay, so fly is very, very powerful um, and they get their fly rule in the charge phase as well. Yeah. When you do have a fly unit, if they are stuck in combat, um, you can fall back over enemy models. Okay, so I can use it in all instances in a movement phase effect. Exactly that, exactly that. So Mike, I've got my repulsor here. This is my vehicle. So this is a different type of unit I have at my disposal here, don't I? How do I move this guy? So a vehicle moves very similarly to uh, a normal infantry model. Okay. Um, and these are all keywords you can find on your data sheet. Infantry, sure. vehicle, monster, uh, fly. Yeah. Uh, so what's the movement characteristic of this repulsor? Uh, it is 10 inches. Okay. So just like your infantry, mm -hmm. you can move up to 10 inches um, as you please. So my question here would be, this guy has a base. Mm-hmm. He also extends over the base because he's, he's quite a big model. Yes. How, where do I measure from for the movement purposes of this model? So you can measure from any part of the hull. Okay. And in this case, the hull just means the model. Essentially. Right, so I measure from, obviously avoiding that engagement range, but I will measure from this point of the model here. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to move it, I can just move it as such. Perfect. And always pick the same point on the model to yep. measure to and from yep, sure. uh, when you're making that move. Vehicles, they can advance, they can remain stationary, they can fall back. Okay. They have all of the same options. Some vehicles have fly, yep. so they can also move over enemy units. You just have to be careful because they're quite big. You need to be able to clear the enemy unit and that one inch engagement range. And again, that comes from the hole as well, measuring from the engagement range purposes, right? Exactly. Big models tend to struggle moving around the tabletop. Yes. Um, but one of the great ways that 140k 10th edition has of helping you move them around is how they interact with your own models. In this instance, the intercessors are in the way of the repulsor. Thankfully, the Space Marines have some coordination, and yep. what you can do with any of your vehicle or monster models is move them through friendly infantry models, provided you don't finish on top of anyone's base. Okay, so it's similar to the fly keyword and the fact that we can just move over the top and we've got to clear the models. Is it worth then measuring from the back of the model? So if we measure from here, it's 10 inches from the back of the model to the point where I can clear these. So if I move this to there, it's effectively gone over the top using the models. Exactly that. Right. Sure. So that's absolutely fine. Yep. Likewise, you could move your intercessors through your vehicle as well. Okay. So you could move like this straight across the actual model and you're absolutely fine to do that. How does this work if this was an enemy model? Is it the same as not being able to go with an engagement range? Yes, yeah, so you can never move through enemy models yep. unless you have that fly keyword. Perfect. Um, the other distinction here is that you can finish within an inch of your own models, mm -hmm. but you can't finish within an inch of the enemy. If you did have multiple tanks and vehicles or monsters in your force, they can't move through each other. Right, so vehicles and monsters can't move through other vehicles and monsters, but anything else like beasts, infantry, cavalry can go through the, the vehicles normal. That's right, and each other. So each other. Uh, if you had two intercessor squads, they could move through each other, uh, right. and they're absolutely fine with that. So next, Mike, we need to discuss terrain. So terrain has its impact on a movement phase. How does it impact us? Okay, so there's some terrain features, and all terrain features have a specific um, keyword or right. name. Right. Uh, we've got on the table here a container and a ruin. Yep. Now, containers, these guys, if you want to move over them, you're going to have to measure the distance up, across, and down. 
bits. So how would we move these guys over this container here? Okay, so what we do is we measure how far we are from touching the container. Right. So we are an inch. An inch, and we'll do this just for this one model here. Okay. Um, how high the container is. It's two inches. Okay, so it's two inches. What the distance across is? Uh, it's about two inches on the thing to move to the other side of it. Okay. Perfect. So we've moved this model five inches. Yeah, and his movement characteristic is six. It's six. Unfortunately, it's two inches to go down. Yeah. So it can't go down. So you still have to use your movement characteristic in, in order to cover the amount of inches up and down of That's the right. train piece. Yeah. So all of those different numbers, add them all together and take them off your movement characteristic. Right. And you may end up finding out that actually these intercessors mm -hmm. are just better off running around the terrain piece. Things do get a little bit different um, for anything that isn't infantry. Right, sure. Uh, or beasts or swarms. So when we're looking at vehicles and monsters, these guys can't traverse a container. Right, so I can't just go up and down this container with this vehicle. Sadly not. Okay, right, that makes um, sense. A lot of these rules, even if you fly, you're never allowed to finish your move on top if your base will overhang or any part of your model. Right, so if the base overhangs the terrain piece, you can't actually have it on that terrain piece. That's right. Does that That's go right. for infantry as well? Um, it does actually go for infantry yeah. as well. Okay. What this means is this repulsor is actually going to have to drive through this gap. Yep. And um, when we're measuring a vehicle, we will have to turn at certain points. Yes. So I would say at a beginner level, try and estimate the amount of inches that it would take to turn this. Mm -hmm. So here I would say we're probably turning maybe three inches. Gets us like that. Yeah. We can move one inch. That's four inches. Mm -hmm. Maybe turn another inch, five inches. And then we can go five inches forward through this gap. Yeah. So it's always worth measuring the turn because the turn and the pivots count towards the movement characteristic yes. that you use, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's moving your vehicles. Now we do have ruins as well. Mm -hmm. uh, infantry and beasts can go straight through ruin, ruin walls, yep. climbing through the windows, through the doors. However, a vehicle, swarms, monsters, these cannot go through um, a ruined wall. Ah, right. Can't okay. risk the damage to themselves. Yeah, sure. That's how ruins work. Now there are various benefits to being in terrain or on top of a terrain or behind it. Uh, including cover and such. And not getting shot. Um, and not getting shot. That's yeah, one of the that's main all, benefits. That's always a good benefit. So that's how terrain impacts the movement phase. As the Tyranid player, are there any other rules, interactions that would affect this army in the movement phase? Yes. So the Tyranids have a number of units mm -hmm. um, that can be taken in quite large numbers. Yes. Um, and when we discussed uh, coherency very briefly earlier, where you have to be within two inches of another model, this Termagant squad has more than seven, well, it has seven or more models in mm -hmm. it which means that each model in that unit has to remain within two inches of another friendly model. These move six inches. So when I move these, I have to make sure that there's at least two within two inches of every single model as I move. Okay, so obviously with the space marines, it's for every one within two inches for coherency. But if you've got seven or models, it's every two within two of coherency. Exactly that. And that's sure. that key number. Yeah. If it's seven or more, two it's of two. two inches of two. Yeah. Um, if it's six or less, it's two of one. What is the, actually the importance of the movement phase? So the movement phase helps us set up the rest of the turn. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to look at why we move our models. What's the purpose of making that normal move? Remaining stationary, falling back, um, or advancing. So the Blood Angels, we've got several different units with different roles. The Jump Pack Assault Intercessors are very good in close combat. So these we want to move with the intention of charging. Yes. The intercessors do a bit more shooting and perhaps might be one of our more mission focused units. Mm -hmm. So these we might want to move to set up shooting or we might want to move in order to get within range of an objective marker. Right. Objective markers, you can be in range of them if you're within three inches of that 40 diameter circle. So you might move a unit, a normal move, just to get within range of it or maybe an advanced move if you can't quite get there. So we want to move to set up charges. We want to move to get to objective markers. Now, we might want to remain stationary to get the benefits of something like heavy so that we're more accurate. Yep. We might want to fall back from a unit so that we can shoot it with another target mm. because you don't want to risk friendly fire. However, the Tyranids have a few more things to think about. So what we've got here is actually a Neurotyrant. Okay. Tyranids function on something called Synapse which means that they need to be within six inches of some of their brain beasts right. in order to maintain their control on the battlefield. Right, okay, so I guess then that means they'll get worse on the battlefield if they're not within this range. Exactly, and this is, this is called an aura ability. Okay. 
So whenever I'm moving something that has a, a brain or is a synapse creature for the tyranids, I want to make sure that when it ends its move, I have other units within six inches of it. Okay, right. There are many examples of aura abilities in the game. Mm. So whenever you're moving, think about, are you setting up a charge? Are you trying to get to an objective marker? Are you trying to shoot something? Or are you trying to maintain an aura distance? Are you trying to maintain an ability distance? Because some aren't auras, yeah. but you might want to trigger uh, some kind of ability at six inches, 12 inches, three inches. So whenever we move, so long as we have that clear focus in mind, we can be confident moving our unit. So the final thing I wanna ask is, what order do you pick your units to move? Is there anything you would look at as the, as the player? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've mentioned those aura style abilities. Uh, now, if you do have those in your army, think about moving those units first, mm -hmm. because they will determine how far your other units can move. Right, okay. So my Neurotyrant here, I'm going to move six inches. Yep. Now I know that my other units need to remain within six inches of this Neurotyrant for that Synapse ability. Right, so you're preemptively placing the models that are then going to give all your buffs out to your other units. Exactly, because I could move my Gargoyles on the side here, and I could move them all over here like this. But this distance is more than six. Yeah, sure, sure, right. But because I've already moved this guy first, the Neurotyrant, I can actually move my gargoyles here to make sure that I'm in that six inch synapse range. Yeah. So if you have any abilities that have a range, consider moving those units first. Right. Now beyond that, you need to think about the space that your units take up mm -hmm. and move anything that might get in the way. Think about whether your priority is to get to the objective or to make that charge, or to shoot that enemy unit, and check the ranges of your weapons and the distance that you can charge. Nice. And I think those are the main concepts to think about when you choose which units to move first. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for joining me. And guys at home, next we'll be looking at the shooting phase. So that'll be the next video in the series. And don't forget to like the video and comment any questions or anything else that you would like to discuss in the movement phase. And we'll see you on the next video very soon. So we really hope you've enjoyed that video. And what we have for you is a start playing course that's a lot more comprehensive. The details are all in the links below. However, that course really breaks down what is quite a complex game into the fundamentals. You spend less time picking up the rule book and more time actually playing on the tabletop with your friends. We break down every single phase of the game. We show you theoretically how that phase works and then we get you straight into a game situation so you can practice what you've learned and by the end of that course you should be ready to go and play some small sided games and if that's of interest of you check out all the links below and we hope to see you on our start playing course soon.